Uh, Alex is going to be back in just a second. We'll get started. Uh, I know there's a couple of new faces. What was your name? Brian. Brian, that's yeah. right. And uh, Jody yep. and Phil. Phil. I could have remembered that because that's my name. <laughs> <laughs> I should have remembered. Thank you for coming out uh, to the cleanup, though. Yeah, uh, it was it yeah, was awesome. I had uh, 21 bags of trash that we managed to get out of. 21? Well, technically, if you put them all together for the full-size trash bag, we probably got about 18. Well, you didn't see the back of my truck. It was it was packed. Um, so that was cool, and and I still haven't processed the video from that day, uh, which uh, I'm gonna put together hopefully this week and get it up there. So those of you that didn't attend could see it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I think we're gonna get started at this point with Alex. Um, um, are you gonna talk a little bit about the port stuff at all, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that way we can tune in everybody to, stuff. we went to the meeting for the Port Authority and what they're trying to do. Uh, still a lot of lack of information, I would say, but uh, we're working on trying to get more information to see exactly what they're attempting to do to the no motor zone. Um, that being said, uh, for those of you who haven't heard Alex before, and I thank you very much for coming in and especially driving all the way oh, yeah. from over there. Um, you know, this is a uh, fourth. Get jittery away from the salt waters. So. Yeah, he gets really <laughs> nervous. Uh, this is like your fourth time speaking for us. Yeah, yeah. Always on a different uh, species. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a very passionate person about fishing, and the stuff that I learn every time, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go and uh, attempt to apply this. So. Uh, right now, uh, the cobia have been running. Uh, rumor has it. I haven't seen one yet. We were out in the port uh, just a couple of weeks ago, but rumor has it. Instead of me talking, let me hook you up on this so we can... Uh, do you have belt loop or... Bingo bango. There you go. And then uh, just pin that where... Somewhere... Right about... Yeah, that's good. That's good. Come right now. Towards you. And I'll get out of your way and shut up. We're live. Test, test, test. All right. <laughs> All right. As uh, Phil actually pointed out, my name is Captain Alex Garichke, uh, LocalLinesCharters.com. I was born and raised here on the Space Coast, uh, luckily enough to a fishing family. We dove and fished and surfed, and that's what we did. We played in the water all the time. Um, I was fortunate enough to get laid off from the Space Center <laughs> and decided to become a fishing guide instead. Um, it's been about uh, seven and a half years now I've been a fishing guide, and um, I try to... Uh, bring what I enjoy to do fishing to my clients, which is just about everything. If it has fins and it swims in salt water, I like to chase it. Um, we have a lot of different opportunities on the Space Coast. Obviously, you have the lagoons, your redfish, your sea trout, your fun stuff like that. Um, we also have uh, something we kayak people like to refer to as BTB, Beyond the Breakers. Okay, That's going out into the ocean and looking for certain fish. Um, came here tonight to specifically speak about cobia and triple tail okay those are two fish that we have frequent off of uh port canaveral off of our coast okay and uh they uh uh triple tail for one stay here pretty much year round like we were speaking about the cobia kind of passed through um real quick uh let me just touch on uh anything you do in the ocean uh one of my good buddies Charles Levi Jr., Redfish Chuck, uh, coined a phrase that says the ocean wants to kill you. It does. It really honestly does. It's not a joke. It's not. It's. It does want to kill you. Okay. It is serious business. You're in a plastic boat, potentially miles from shore, in the middle of the ocean. You're a pin drop in the middle of that grand scheme. All right. And our ocean is unique in the fact that we have the Gulf Stream and it's relatively close. Chances are you're not going to make it there in a, in a kayak. But if you become disabled and the wind's blowing 15 knots out of the west all of a sudden, well, you're going to get there eventually. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to end up somewhere off of South Carolina. It's not going to be you're going to be floating out here. You're going to end up out there. One thing I always stress, take a buddy. Um, I'm actually kind of, uh, you know, I could be accused of not doing that myself quite often. I'll jump and go. I don't have somebody to go with me. I'm gone. Um, but one thing I always do if I don't have a buddy, and even if I do have a buddy, I file a float plan. And most people don't understand, you know, in the kayak world, don't, don't think in terms of, okay, what is a float plan? Well, a float plan happens to be as simple as you telling your wife 
or your friend or your coworker or your buddy down the street, hey, I'm going out off the beach tomorrow. I'm going to be launching probably off of Patrick. Okay, we're going to go out and we're going to paddle around and I should be home by dark. You know, if you don't show up by 6 o'clock the next morning, somebody better be on the phone. Hopefully they're on the phone a lot sooner than that. You know, and people get found that way. People get saved that way because you can get in trouble out there. Always wear a life jacket. Um, I forgot to grab mine when I went out there. I was going to throw it on. Uh, there's another guy that does some seminars. Uh, he's from down south, uh, Andrew Mixon. He's a real good guy, good fisherman. Um, and he's really been pushing. And he'll do his seminars with his jacket on the whole time just to show you that it's not anything to wear. These inflatables, they're cheap, under 100 bucks, and it'll save your life. It feels like nothing on you, little things. Um, now that we're done with the scary stuff, launching out of the surf, I could do a whole entire seminar on that, so we're not even going to do it. If you've done it, go for it. If you haven't, try it several times with none of your stuff on your kayak. That way you roll it, you deal with it, you understand how the kayak reacts, and you don't lose all your gear in the process. Okay. Um, real quick, I'm going to touch on cobia first, uh, mostly because they're more of a a migratory species and it's something that we only get for a short period of time here uh, although we get it several times a year. Um, typically they're not going to hang around for six months like the tarpon do in the summer um, or something like that. They're going to pass through. Okay, A cobia spends his winter in the Keys. I mean what's wrong with that? Nothing really. They all head to the Keys. Okay, Every single one of them. All of them on the East Coast. Uh, you might find some on the wrecks and stuff that are way down south, south of Miami. But for the most part, they're all in the Keys, okay? The West Coast fish, the East Coast fish, they all head down there in the winter, all right? In the spring, everybody goes cobia crazy. The tower boats are hauling butt to Port Canaveral. There's big jigs on everybody's rods flopping in the wind, okay? It's because those cobia actually move north as it warms in the spring, okay? They'll spend, spend their summer up off the Carolinas, and then they'll actually shift back south as it cools. All right, so we actually get them at two points in time, the spring run, and then there's another run in the fall. The fall run's not as well known because typically the seas are up a little bit more in the fall. There's a little, it's a little bit more sporty. So it's not the you know, nice calm spring days that you get. It's usually a little snotty out and the guys in the big boats are out there having the fun. That doesn't mean you can't get those choice days in between and go out there and get some good fish, okay? A cobia by nature, um, there's a few things they enjoy. One is a certain water temperature. It's 68 to 72 degrees. That's their envelope. That's what they like. Okay. If you're out there and your depth finder reads 64 degrees, you might as well take that cobia jig and clean your ear with it because it's not going to do you any good. Those cobia are not going to be there. If it's warmer, say it's 78 degrees and you're out there looking for tarpon, well, I've actually caught cobia while trolling for tarpon and a ray pops up and there's cobia underneath it. Um, any, any temperature above that 68 degree mark can hold them, but their real true place that they're happy is 68 to 72 degrees. So what happens in the spring is you start getting a little bit of southerly winds. It starts dragging that warmer water up the coast of Florida, and it drags basically an envelope of 68 to 72 degree water up the coast. It starts roughly from about... St. Lucie Inlet, uh, Stewart area, is where it really starts pulling off, and that envelope of water will actually, you'll see it, watch it move up, okay? The Gulf Stream stays roughly that, 72 degrees, 68, somewhere in there, 74. Uh, sometimes it gets a little hotter in the, war, in the, in the summer, um, but it's roughly that. So what ends up happening is the Gulf Stream's real close to Florida at the very bottom, and as you come up towards Canaveral, it pulls off, okay? And it'll leave that warm water, and that warm water will start moving its way up. One thing Cape Canaveral does is it actually traps that warm water for a little bit. We were talking about those fish on the shoals, kind of, okay? So if you think of Cape Canaveral as a, as a big point out into, the, out into the ocean, as that water's sliding up, you have opposing currents that are kind of milling around from the Gulf Stream, and it creates kind of a convergence of currents. Um, when that water moves up, what happens is those cobia actually aren't with manta rays down in, in the Keys. They're down there by themselves. They're just swimming around, okay? They move up. They pick up turtles. They pick up stingrays, um, a lot of reefs and wrecks as they come up South Florida. Um, once they hit about the Fort Pierce area is when they split off of the, the Gulf Stream water. They start coming inside, and they come up towards us. 
First they go through some areas that are reef. While they're doing that and they move towards Canaveral, they come onto the manta rays. That is our big claim to fame here in Canaveral, is the manta rays, okay? If anybody hasn't seen a manta ray, it's the real giant ones that look like an airplane down there with the little twirly things up front. Really cool to see. Um, actually, got some, my Facebook page has some pretty cool photos. Uh, we were swimming and flying a drone with them. They were pretty neat. But um, the, the manta ray is just what it is. It's a big old giant ray, okay? Manta ray makes his living one way is eating a whole bunch of plankton every day, all day. That's all they do. They hunt plankton, okay? And you kind of wonder, well, how does that associate back to your cobia, okay? And this also shows, associates to how you're going to find your manta rays and cobia. Because when you're going fishing for cobia out here off of Canaveral, typically you're not looking for the fish. You're looking for the manta ray. You're not fishing for a cobia. You're fishing for a manta ray at that point in time, okay? So if you know what the manta ray needs, you're going to find him, hence find the cobia. Okay, so what happens is those fish kind of get onto these manta rays. They all pile up underneath them, and they're swimming with them. And then the manta rays are real thick from about Melbourne, 60-foot bottom, which is about five miles offshore, all the way up till you keep going north. And uh, the manta rays kind of start tapering off once you get up towards Jacksonville and stuff, and, and they kind of start looking for just free-swimming fish. Okay, Port Canaveral happens to hold so many manta rays because of those convergence of currents. You got eddies that pull off of the Gulf Stream, you got the warm water coming up, you got shoals that are creating other little breaks in the currents. And what that does is that causes edges and it causes plankton to gather. All right. Now, before I get too crazy on talking about plankton, like I said, that manta ray has to eat, I'm talking buckets of plankton a day. Buckets. The fish, the, the cobia, is looking for the, the manta ray. Cobia don't eat plankton, they eat fish. Well, what else eats plankton? bait fish. So that cobia knows if he's with Mr. Manta Ray, he's going through bait fish eventually because he's going to find plankton. So what these cobia are doing, they're not just hanging out with them for shade or just chilling with them, which they do, you know, draft behind them, the extra, you know, give them, they're actually using that manta ray to find them food. So when they're up underneath that manta ray, yeah, oh yeah, that's the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were down there playing around with a GoPro and having some fun with the manta rays and the drone. But, um, you know, that manta ray is, not only is when he goes down to the bottom, is he going to potentially blow things off the bottom with his wings? Shrimp, crab, um, one fish we filleted this year was so stuffed full of flounder that I don't know how he could have fit our jig in his mouth, let alone anything else in his stomach. And they were all about yay big, just little, little chipper flounders, and he was stuffed full of them half digested, f looked like he just ate the thing five minutes ago, and he was slap full of them. Those, that day, we were having a hard time finding the rays. What the rays were doing is we'd see them jump from a distance. You, these rays will clear the water. 12, 14-foot wingspan ray will clear the water by 15, 20 feet. It's and true. wham, hit the hit. And a lot of times, they'll shake their fish off when they do that. The fish will kind of look around, okay, where's my ray at? You know, oh, no, oh, my goodness, where am I going? Um, so if you do have something jump next to you, obviously go that way. You never know what's going to happen. Um, that day, though, the rays were staying real low. So in my mind, what happened was the fish we got, the ray happened to pop up for just a couple minutes. Boom, we got some casts. I got one fish off of it. Um, and then uh, that was actually one of the days we were out filming. Um, and then uh, we missed another hit. And the, that ray went back down. Um, that fish was w the one that had just all those co or all those floundering. So that ray was staying on the bottom, and as he's flapping those wings, flounder are scooting, and boom, they're on them. You know, they eat them up like that. Okay, your pilchards, your horn bellies, and things like that, those little white baits, those are all filter feeding baits. Your pogie is a filter feeding bait. Uh, filter feeding, more a pogie, and then like your plankton eaters and small little minnow eaters are your pilchards and stuff like that. Okay, they know if they hang with that ray, that ray is going to come through clouds of bait eventually because he's hunting out this plankton. Okay, um, to find your plankton, which is the best way to find your rays without them jumping or without seeing wingtips, you actually, all, all you have to do is look for slicks on the water. And what I mean by a slick is literally it'll have the water slicked out and it's usually in a row. Sometimes there's some grass caught in it, but you'll look and it'll be almost a film on top of the water. 
and you can see it's like it's plankton soup basically is what it is okay there's a film a slip right on top of the water and when you come over top of it if you look in it i mean it's just all kinds of little things going like that well that's where that ray wants to be that's where he's going for so that's your best way to find them. of course you can always find them free swimming and stuff like that um, the buoys are another great option a lot of fish are caught off the buoys you pull up to it and there's a giant cobia just laying right next to it looking at the buoy like okay what am i going to do now and it happens quite often um bait pods also will hold fish okay like i said you have that degree you know 68 to 72 degree water it moves up in the spring in the fall it'll end up pushing back down once it drops below that you know you'll 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 stop seeing those cobia um cobia are an aggressive fish they're a large fish they can be the fresh, most frustrating fish you've ever tried to catch in your life when there's five of them around the boat and they won't touch anything you have. Um, your most common rig for a cobia, real quick, is anybody, if anybody has any questions at any point in time. Yeah, that's all right. This thing's, this thing's been through the ringer. <laughs> a fan can't take it out. I don't, well, it might. But. I don't know. This is the broomstick right here. This thing's had some, had some, had some slime on it. So you don't get that, that jig cut on the yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, your standard setup for a cobia, because it's a large, powerful fish, is going to be something in the heavy spinning rod range. Something you can still manage and throw. You don't want some big crazy uh, contraption that you can't you know heave out there. But you're throwing large jigs. You're not throwing little tiny baits. Um, this is one I I throw. Um, you almost always seem to put a trailer of some sort on there it just adds a little body and a little motion to it um everybody loves bright for cobias which it works great they see it and they they see it from a long distance it hits the water and they usually hunt that thing down and come after it uh, a lot of times if those cobia happen to be maybe in weed lines or something like that uh, which is something we commonly see out here is you'll actually be coming along a weed line and i'll talk more about those when i'm talking about the triple tail but you'll come along a weed line and there'll be a cobia up in the weeds. Um, he will jump on this jig. But sometimes having a more natural, maybe a white or a brown or a yellow, um, if that cobia refuses something like this, having something that's a little more natural colored to offer them. Because what they're in the weeds looking for is little sargasm fish, things like that. They'll actually swim around in weeds and they'll knock the weeds around with their dorsal fin. They slash around in there. And then all this stuff comes falling out. Little crabs, all kinds of crap comes falling out of that weeds. And he scoots right back around and picks it all up. And, uh, you know, you throw this big old giant honking chartreuse cobia jig at him and he's been eating little shrimp this big. He's probably going to go, what the heck is that? I don't want nothing to do with that. You know, so have a little variety for that cobia. Um, just like our redfish or, you know, when you're sight fishing, uh, you're going to want to lead your fish. You obviously don't want to drop it straight on their heads. This is almost always sight fishing, um, especially for us in kayaks. You're going to be looking to get out there and potentially see either cruising fish up on the surface or a ray and be able to throw at that ray or a turtle or something of that nature. They're looking for something to orientate to. They don't necessarily like to be out swimming by themselves. They will, but they don't like it. They want to be with something. You know, your little green turtle this big, I wouldn't paddle a mile to try to go get to him. But if there's a couple hundred yards over that way, you see a 500-pound, you know, loggerhead pop up, get over a big old leatherback, you know, or something big, get over there and check it out. Any floating debris, anything like that. Um, when I'm rigging for cobia, because I know I'm you, the potential of the fish, you know, your average size fish is going to be probably 15 to 20 pounds. Um, they get upwards... The biggest one I've seen caught was 93 and a half pounds. And it was caught off the Cocoa Beach Pier by a guy shark fishing one night. I was working. I was like 16, 17 years old, working in the, as a bar back. And he whacked the biggest cobia I've ever seen in my entire life. He fought it for an hour and a half. The entire time they thought it was a giant shark. Next to the pier they thought it was a giant shark because it was so big. We all ate really good that night. Really good that night because it took him forever to clean it talking cobia fillets that were like that wide it was nuts um that was no more than 100 yards off the cocoa beach pier you know this isn't something that you need to go 10 miles out to try to do 
Okay, those fish can come anywhere from literally the shore pound out to as far as you want to go. Okay, so when you go out there looking for your cobia, um, you know, and you have some bait in 15 foot of water, we'll take a look around that bait. You know, just like when you're out there looking for your tarpons or whatever. You know, if you see something that catches your interest, you want to obviously look at it. Um, cobia look like a shark. That's why I said that. I mean, if you haven't seen them, they're just they're brown and kind of wide headed, look like a catfish kind of almost. Um, and they typically, if they're by themselves, are up on the top. Even if they're in bait pods, they're usually up at the top of the bait pod. You'll see them laying up there like a big log. Um, they're kind of the Homer Simpson of the fish sometimes. Um, when you present anything to them, uh, especially these, uh, there's a method to, to actually work this um, in these larger baits. I'll pass a couple of these around. This is a cool one. I grabbed it uh, over a beach side that I saw the other day and I knew I was coming out here. And uh, I mean, that's just pretty awesome looking, a big old giant curly tail. What they want is they want big, they want meaty they want something they can grab a hold on you guys kind of pass those around that williamson is right up here in the shop um you know a lot of times i might have a heavy jig on one and then a lighter jig on the other this is a little bit lighter you know that's uh probably about an ounce and a half ish or somewhere in there maybe two ounce three, three ounce yeah that's a big one this is maybe an ounce and uh, this is that one so you know a three ounce that's going to punch down quick you know, this right here will, it'll say, you know, land a little lighter, a little less abrasive. Um, with the cobia, unfortunately, this year, it's been a really weird year. I mean, and by weird, I mean, like, almost non-existent cobia run. Uh, we had great amounts of, uh, of rays everywhere. Very few cobia with them. Um, we had a lot of bait, no cobia in there. Uh, they got, they're got. they getting them north of us now, so they've already passed us by, basically. But those fish are still here, per se. They don't all leave. There's lingers, there's ones that don't cruise through. It looks like what happened for us this year is they might have gone outside of us. So what that tells me is there's probably a lot of fish out on your wrecks and your reefs and stuff like that. Most of the people that did good this season did good out on bottom. And what will happen is you'll drop a bottom bait down and you reel your bottom fish up, little sea bass or whatever, and there's 20 cobia behind it. And you go, oh, my gosh. And they swarm your boat. And if you get one or two, you're good. If not, they go right back down to the bottom and you try to get another one to come up. You know, and that's basically the people that did good this year. That's where they did good. Um, we did decent on the uh, rays, but it wasn't very consistent. We'd go through a lot of rays to find one with some fish on it. Um, that doesn't mean that we couldn't get another wave of them at any point in time. Um, like I said, I've been out there in the dead middle of summer and had rays pop up and have them, you know, be ready. Uh, anytime you're dealing with a cobia, if you, if you get lucky enough to come across one in your kayak and you get it to you, and then you got to deal with the thing, okay? Um, like I said, they're very powerful. They're known, I've personally seen them literally blow a cooler up. And I'm not talking like the lid came popping. I'm talking the sides out of it, lid gone out of the boat, exploded a cooler. Because the guy gaffed it and stuck it straight in there green, and it flipped out, and it exploded the cooler. They're known to break fishing poles, break legs, break everything that comes within their tail's reach. It's a very powerful tail, and they know how to use it. And they go ballistic when you stick them with a gaff. I mean, they freak out. Every, obviously, you just stuck it with a gaff. I mean, you know. I spearfished a, a 70 pound coat yeah. two years ago, and uh, yeah, it pulled me around. Yeah. It was 130 feet of water, nope. and it pulled me around. It'll drag you. You know, they're a powerful fish. Um, one thing I recommend if you do come across one in your kayak and you want to take it with you is wear that thing out till it is practically dead. Just let it pull you and pull you and pull you and pull you till it rolls up and just gives up next to you. Um, Even that doesn't always take care of it. No, because they, they'll they keep going and keep going. Um, one thing I have been looking at, and I've been, uh, I've got uh, I've got the materials at house. I wanted to get it made before I came, but I haven't had a chance. Um, I've been super busy. But uh, the guys out in Hawaii who do a lot of blue water fishing out of kayaks, I mean, they've been doing it for ever, literally. Had a little dugout canoes, <laughs> but they use uh, what's called a keg, a keg. It's K E G E. 
Yeah. And basically what it is, is it's a dowel, wooden dowel, you know, inch and a half or whatever, wooden dowel that's four foot long or three foot long. And they take a piece of all thread. They drill out the end and they screw all thread into the end of it. And what you have is you have a four foot wood rod and then a piece of all thread sticking out of it like that. They sharpen the tip of the all thread. They don't put any barb or anything like that on it. But when you drive that all thread through the fish, it grabs meat and bone and everything else. And I've actually, I had a couple guys that do, uh, for the red snapper season, I do mothership trips. And a couple guys brought them with me. And they, they I had them stick, uh, we, still, we stuck a cobia with one, and we stuck several big snapper with them. And you actually end up, if you, it's basically like you're harpooning the fish. So you can get them up next to you, and you can have a line attached to this. I wouldn't recommend attaching it to your boat, maybe to a couple floats or something like that, if you're really going out there hunting for some bear. Um, but you could use it as a just ditch it kind of situation. Um, you stick it, and what ends up happening is that all thread drives in, it grabs all that meat. And we were actually having to take and unscrew this thing out of the fish. That's how hard it bites on it. I was really impressed. Um, when you think of the mechanics, the actual physical mechanics of gaffing a fish, um, uh, the all thread is, um, I'm using a half, half inch, and then uh, I actually went for a two inch uh, thing. I'm going to wrap some rope around the end of it so I have a little handle so I can stick the fish. Um, when you think of the mechanics of gaffing a fish, you are swinging, hooking, and pulling back in at you, typically in a boat, swinging into the boat. You gaff a fish next to your kayak, the only place you have to go is right on your lap with a hooked fish that's probably really angry and a big giant gaff in your hand now in that fish somewhere. Um, it's really kind of a dangerous proposition. Uh, I've taken uh, several kingfish now and a couple Kobe off the, off the kayaks with gaff, and it's basically been a gaff and stick the thing next to the boat until it stops moving and just let it sit. Just pin it up next to the boat, hope the gaff don't go through the side of the boat, and we got one king that was probably about 28, I think it was 28 to 30 pounds. He was a nice one. And uh, we stuck that, and it freaked out. And I was, I was holding it, my client. I was holding on to him, and he's holding on me. And I'm just... But eventually, it, it stopped. And we took our fish, and we stuffed it in the bag, and we went on about our business. Um, again, in the fall, like I said, you have another shot at these cobia. One thing I always do, um, you know, if you're already out there, basically out there beyond the breakers, you probably should already be rigged for cobia. Um, most people are going to be out there doing kingfish, doing tarpon, doing something that's going to require you to have gear like this, okay? While you're in transit or while you're out cruising around, you know, maybe have that, that big, bright, colorful jig on and your eyes scanning ready. Um, same with live baits. Cobia love a live bait. There's nothing wrong with putting a live bait in front of them if you got some mullet or whatever, you know. Have that bait ready to cast and just always keep your eyes open. They're one of those fish, as long as the water's warm enough, they can pop up at any time. Um, we have a good run that happens in the winter, or in the summer, I meant. Dead middle of summer, uh, the water on the beach gets real cold. It's called Labrador current, okay? And what happens is the westerlies, the predominant westerlies in the mornings, blow that warm water back and it refills in with cold water. And you're talking like 50 degree water on the beach. It's cold, okay? Well, there's pockets of warm water. Most of them are out by the shoals and stuff like that. But a lot of times what will happen is you'll have that upwelling bring that real cold water into the beach. It also pushes those fish that happen to be on the reefs and stuff like that off, and they'll start moving around again. And all of a sudden you start hearing about uh, bait pods down in, Sabat or down in uh, satellite that have cobia in them. And that's because that upwelling has actually brought those fish in to us. Uh, same with the rays. The rays will start popping back up again. So always be ready for them, and, uh, and they can really treat you well. Kobe is great to eat. Uh, it's uh, 33 inches to the fork for the fish, okay? Nose to the, the center of the fork. 33-inch fish is what you get to keep. Um, we're at, you're at, I guess it's one in state and two out. So two in federal, if you're outside of three miles, you can keep two fish. If you're inside of three miles, you can keep one in a kayak because it's a blurred line. I would only keep one. Um, plus, it's a big fish, and you got only so much room on the kayak. Um, 
with the whole state federal if you have two fish on your boat and you stop 100 yards off the beach and throw a lure and that marine patrol comes buzzing by and he goes hey how's it going looks like you're fishing excellent what do you got in there oh you got two cobia boom you're busted okay so the way they do that is if they catch you stopped within three miles you're done basically so if you have a limit of fish that was federal federal limit which is higher than the state limit um, you need to you basically just go straight in so it's kind of this gray area keep it at one you don't have to worry about any of that garbage um, one of the fish that I want to talk about tonight that aren't seasonal that are here practically year-round um, unlike the cobia which come and go um, is our triple tail uh, it's become kind of hot now too especially since we have uh, the new boat ramp at Port Canaveral for anybody who doesn't know, the new boat ramp at Port Canaveral is by far the best way you can ever get out into the ocean in a kayak. Um, there is no seas to deal with. There is no breaking waves. There is no nothing. You put your kayak in, you paddle out into the ocean. Okay, it works out great, um, other than the fact that it's Port Canaveral, so you obviously have a very much increased boat traffic, um, potentially large boats, uh, people maybe not paying attention. So much like when you're out here on I-4, in the middle of rush hour and everybody's going 90 mile an hour keep your head about you you know don't go paddling your kayak across the middle of the running lane when 40 boats are coming out um, there's been a lot of activity activity with the subs coming in and out and i've seen a couple guys you know try to try to try to do the shotgun start with all the boats when the sub come you know when the finally the sub goes and everybody's been waiting and then wow and there you guys pat you know just wait Wait five minutes, everybody goes, and then you don't have to worry about getting yourself run over and killed because um, it can happen. Unfortunately, I do see potential for Port Canaveral to end up being an issue with a boat strike and a kayak. And just because, especially if you're talking afternoon thunderstorms, inclement weather, somebody might have been out there and coming back in, there's a lot of potential there. It's a small area, and it's a lot of boats moving around. Um, one thing that is one of my favorite fish and by far one of our best fish i feel on the face on the space coast is the triple tail all right triple tail is a funky little guy if you haven't seen them they look like a brim almost but the size of a garbage can lid or they can be um kind of have a little three lobe tail that uh, allows them to kind of lay flat okay um triple tail are found literally everywhere around the atlantic okay they're home base where they evolved what they became to do was uh they're part of an ecosystem that we have out in the middle of the atlantic called the sargasm sea okay that funny little brown weeds that you see float up on the beach all the time that's sargasm weed okay and that actually grows in this giant pile of weeds in the middle of the ocean it's the craziest thing ever it's the sargasm sea okay so as this big sargasm clump is in the middle of the ocean, it breaks up and pieces fall off. Um, a whole series of animals have evolved around just this sargasm sea, this sargasm weed. It's an ecosystem in and of itself. It grows, but it's an ecosystem because you're talking about the open ocean where there is nothing. It is blank blue ocean for as far as you can see okay so these little weeds have become their own ecosystem and they've got their own types of shrimp that are in there crabs little sargasm fish fish you will only find in this weed only come out of this weed okay triple tail that's where they came from they're part of that ecosystem their game in life their their way of being is to sit and chill and wait for it to happen okay in a term they're almost like a flounder that floats Okay, if you can think of a flounder, he hangs on the bottom and just waits for things to happen. Might move here, might move there, but he's waiting for something to float over. Triple tail's doing the same thing. He's chilling and waiting. Okay? They tend to come in on the weeds. When we get a heavy wind, the weeds come in and those triple tail come with it. Okay? What that triple tail looks to do is float around and look just like the weeds and camouflage himself in the weeds. They'll be anywhere from black as night to yellow is that packaging on there to malted brown and purple and i mean just crazy different colors to to attempt it's actually not purple blues and i've seen blue brim tail i mean all kinds of stupid stuff uh, but they attempt to mimic their surroundings almost like a chameleon 
Okay, and what this triple tail does is he just floats around with these weeds, and when the fish comes swimming up, he boom, he hits the, the thing. Okay, so you would think, well, how does that really help us here with a with a consistent fishery? Um, Port Canaveral happens to be known as one of the few areas in the world that they actually believe, because there's very little science on them, that there is a spawning population. We have fish that spawn, that live. They don't necessarily move north and south and, and migrate as much as they maybe thought they did back in the day. They actually migrate in and, sh in and off our shoreline. Um, basically, if the water's above about 63 degrees, which is like probably 75% of our year, um, and the moon is full, there is triple tail on the buoys. I can guarantee it. There are triple tail. Right now, there are triple tail on the buoys. It's a little sporty out there, so you might have a hard time getting to them, but they're there. It's actually going to be nice this weekend. Um, the full moon is actually when they spawn. They do it year-round. So anytime there's a full moon, Port Canaveral has triple tail out there on the buoys, hanging around. Okay. Anytime we get that heavy blow, we get weeds in, we get more fish. They get supplied from the ocean. They come in, floating in on those weeds. You can pull up on a, on a, on a weed line 45 miles offshore and 500 triple tail come out and look at you. Oh, what is that? Okay, Because they've just been floating with that thing for the last who knows how long since it's been out in the middle of god-awful nowhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. you know. But they end up on our beach. For some reason, they like Canaveral. I don't know if it's the shoals. I don't know if it's the Cape. We don't really know why. There's a lot of shrimp on the bottom out there in Canaveral. Um, they think that might have something to do with it. Uh, Canaveral is one of the few areas where you can consistently go out and catch a triple tail over, of a, over about 15 pounds. Um, the, the, the triple tail kind of breaks down into maybe like three series of fish. One is fish that you find free swimming, which is real common out here out of Canaveral, where you will literally be paddling along in your kayak and there is a triple tail just laying there right next to you. Okay, I'm gonna catch that one. Okay, it happens really often, uh, typically, around the full moons because it seems to be a function of their spawning. They like to float out and they'll get in groups. You'll actually see schools of 30 or 40 of them swimming under the surface. Um, it's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, there's also fish that, that hold and stay on the buoys. Um, the Ca Canaveral has a buoy line that runs out almost, well, if you go all the way to the end, it's almost eight miles out. Um, the end, end, or the end of the, the double buoys is about six and a half, seven. Um, it's all pretty much kayakable, especially the close ones, uh, and they all hold fish. A lot of times those fish are uh, really, really crafty, uh, to say the least. The buoy fish are some of the hardest fish to catch. Probably some of the most consistent bite, but some of the hardest to actually catch and land. Um, I forgot to bring my little buoy thing. I wish I had some... Oh, I know what I can use. Aha! So, where in the heck is that? I feel like when stuff gets complicated. There it is. Sorry about that. So, this is our buoy, our impromptu buoy. Okay? So you pull up to the Canaveral buoy, and you put your bait down, and you're fishing, and you're not getting hits, and you're not getting hits, and you leave. And then some guy behind you pulls up and drops one bait down, and wham, he's on. What did he do different than you? Okay, one thing you got to understand about a buoy, okay, these fish are almost like a sheep's head when they're on this buoy. So they're sitting on it. They're not typically swimming out around it. They're usually right up next to the chain facing into the current. Okay, they want something to sweep by that chain. Boom, they hit it, and then they come right back to their spot right behind the chain and just sit and chill out. Okay, when that buoy is floating, it's not directly straight up and down from its chain. I know it's going to be hard to see because it's a fishing line, but it's not going to be straight up and down. That buoy is actually probably going to be anywhere they're supposed to have a 60 foot radius, I believe it is. I'm trying to remember my captain's license course. There's a swing radius on every buoy. So they anchor it, and that's your fixed location where they can mark it on a chart. That's where your buoy is. 
But that buoy is going to actually swing anywhere from 50 to 75 feet around that center location. So when you're fishing the buoy and you're floating right here in your little kayak and you're dropping your bait down right here, well that chain's way over here and you're actually not even effectively fishing it whatsoever. Okay, one thing that can eliminate a lot of that guesswork is having a depth finder because you will actually be able to see this chain on that depth finder and you will actually be able to see the fish sitting on the chain. So it will eliminate you even having to stop there if there's no fish on it. You can look on it if you see the chain and you see big stripes or big marks around that chain that are kind of horizontal as opposed to that, that more vertical looking chain. Well, that's probably fish sitting on it and you'll want to drop a bait down. Okay, when you're fishing this buoy, you don't want to just fish right up here underneath because they will sit under there, but the majority of your fish are going to be along that chain. Um, a lot of times, if I don't have a depth finder, like I don't have a depth finder on my kayak, I'll find the chain simply by using my jig or my lure or my bait. And, oh, that's the chain, and I'll, I'll back it right off of that and stay right in that general area and kind of float it around that chain and try to get that hit, okay? That chain's really the key to the buoy fish. So you have the free swimmers and you have the buoy fish. Um, the buoy fish will run through their, their tackle real quick. Um, this would be my typical triple tail rod. Unless I was going to the buoy and I knew I was going after some good fish. And then I would actually use this. Okay, seems kind of overkill, doesn't it? It's not, not even close. Because you hook a 15 plus pound triple tail next to that chain and he's going to run you into it. This will actually give you some stopping power. It'll give you a little bit of, you know, a little bit of thicker line. Um, one thing that uh, it takes a little while to learn, but if you can get good at it, you can actually walk that fish off the buoy and not set up on it. You can get the thump and slowly get him to come off. It's easier in like a Hobie or if you got a trolling motor, obviously. Um, but if you're in a paddle kayak, basically you're going to be at the mercy of that fish. So you want to have gear that can handle it. Um, with a Hobie, you can kind of do, 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 and then start fighting your fish. And it'll walk out with you. That fish will actually, boom, grab that bait and come with you for 15, 20 feet off. Uh, a couple of my commercial guy, when he, he anchors and when he hooks, he slowly walks up to the front of his boat. And at that point in time, he's just taking that fish 15 feet off of that buoy. Boom, he hits him and he gets him in the boat. Stick him and get him, okay? Um, that fish will kind of cruise with you. Like I said, if you're not in a Hobie or have a trolling motor, you're at the mercy of that fish. Best thing to do is hit it <laughs> and hold on for the ride because it's going to be a good one. Um, one thing I will say is if they do chain you and you feel it in the chain and you know you're in the chain because they will, um, if you take this thing and flip the bail and relieve pressure on that line, you will not cut the line. Okay. At that point in time, you can attempt to determine Am I this way around the chain? Am I that way around the chain? And try to get yourself off the chain. As long as you don't put tension, even with monofilament, as long as you don't put tension, that thing will run right along every single one of those big old chunky barnacles, and it won't cut most of the time. Okay? Not all the time. Most of the time. The minute you come tight on that, and it's on one of the barnacles, boom, it's done. It's over. Um, it's the same thing if you're fighting a fish in the mangroves. If you go ahead and... If he runs up in the mangroves and he's got you all twisted back in there, flip the bail. A lot of times they'll actually swim back out the same way they came in and you can go back to fighting your fish. Um, it gives you a chance to at least figure out where the line is and what it happens to be around. Um, by losing that tension though, it's not going to cut. Okay. Most people, when they fish the buoys for the triple tail, they fish with a live shrimp. It's kind of like your go-to bait. It's a standard. Um, I prefer to fish my live shrimp on a jig head. Uh, some people do it with a, a couple split shots, maybe in a, in a hook. I prefer the jig head. It gets a little bit more penetration. You're able to get it down there and uh, you're able to hold, uh, hold a little bit better in any current or also any uh, chop or something like that. It helps you get a little bit more fidelity out of it. Um, what you're going to want to do is, and a lot of people go, I want super jumbo trimps. Look like lobsters. Yeah, they work. But I've caught 28 pound triple tail on a little itty bitty shrimp. I mean, they're going to eat it. If, if they're hungry and that shrimp comes floating in front of them, I don't care if it's this big or if it's this big, he's going to eat the thing. Okay? So, what I typically do with my shrimp is I'll take that live shrimp and I will actually hook him straight through the mouth. And you can actually see they'll have a little mouth down there. It's a little mouthy thing. And you go straight vertically through the horn. 
You stay in front of his little brain, his little dark spot. That shrimp will ride on that jig head just like that. Okay? And what he'll do is as he comes down, a, a shrimp's natural way of being, way of swimming, is to use his little kicker legs and just slowly cruise straight. And then when something comes at him, he'll snap backwards and do his little snappy backwards thing. Well, this right here allows that shrimp to almost troll straight down. Keeps him nice, nice and in line, looking there like a perfect shrimp. When that triple tail noses up to him, which they almost always do, they're an inquisitive fish. So they have to nose up to something before they actually hit. He'll nose up. That thing still can snap his tail backwards. A lot of people will pop the tail and shove the, the jig head down the tail, which is effective. It works. But with this, when that jig head or when that, sh that triple tail comes up on that shrimp and he's looking at it, that shrimp pops backwards because he can pop backwards with that jig head in his nose. He just snaps. When he snaps, it's off. I mean, it's it instantly that fish, it's, that tr triggers that feed reaction the minute that, that shrimp goes backwards. Um, when you have it all locked up there in the jig head, you got to kind of, that's why a lot of people will jig them. Um, this, you just take and, and simply send it down. Send it around that buoy, send it around the chain, get it down around there, let it float, let it move. Um, one of the little tricks, uh, my, my buddy who's a commercial guy, and I use them too, is small jigs like these. Little ounce, uh, little feather jigs. You can put a shrimp in that if you want. You can put a little strip on it if you want. Okay, He hand ties all his own, little short ones. And actually actually actively fish this. Send it down and pop it around. Bring it up a little bit, pop it around. And what they'll do is they'll see that thing going all over and they'll come up to it and it's bouncing and eventually they just get angry at it and slam it. You know, it takes them a little while sometimes. Um, that guy right there, I, I, I bless him for his patience. He will sit on a buoy if he knows there's fish there because he can see them on his depth finder for four hours until those fish eat. Because they might not eat until... For some reason, boom, somebody hits a switch, and they go nutso, and he'll put his 10 fish that's his limit in his boat and go home. Um, and he'll, he'll sit there on that buoy for four hours. It's tough to do, believe me. Um, so little jigs, white, pinks are all good. Chartreuses are good. Um, obviously, the live shrimp with the jig head is great. Um, I'll even slap a lot of times uh, just a paddle tail on there. Um, I got one on there. You know, just your simple little three-inch paddle tail. Uh, one of the more recent ones we got was coming in uh, just a while back. And we had been out flounder fishing or messing around. And uh, had him stand this right next, to, right next to the buoy, just playing. Wham! And it was, I think, an 18-pound fish. It was a good fish. Uh, and that was the buoy inside the port. You don't have to be outside the port. These fish come in the port. I've caught... I've caught triple tail up to, um, I got one that was about seven pounds out of the no motor zone, pedaling across the no motor zone, floating on the top of the water. I look over, I throw a jerk bait in front of it, wham, I'm on. Um, I know several people that run their own personal crab traps in the no motor zone up towards the causeway. They work out at the Cape and they do not go pull their crab traps without a triple tail rod with them because they see them that frequently out there. Uh, we got one that was almost 12 pounds last not this last shrimp season, but the year before, um, at the railroad bridge in Titusville, uh, shrimping one night. It sat there staring at our light, and we popped a shrimp on, and wham, we were on. Put the thing in the boat, and went home with a bucket of shrimp and, <laughs> and a triple tail. It was a really good night. Um, What's your average size triple tail? Your average size is going to be probably in the 5 to 12 pound range, 6 to 12 pound. Um, they max out in our area at about 40 pounds. 35, 40, um, those are pretty rare. Breaking 30, you're turning some heads at the dock. 25 pound fish, people are like, yeah, it's a solid one. Those 10 to 15 pound fish are almost a dime a dozen. Um, there's a lot of 10 to 15 pound fish out there. Uh, the buoy fish, um, like I said, they're mean. They're, they're, they they want to put you, a lot of times when you pull that fish up, he's got scrapes and tears down his side because they will actually, you can feel them do it bam, and slam right into the chain and shoot off of it. And then turn 180 degrees and come right back in and slam themselves right into the chain again. They're trying to rid whatever it is in their face off of them. They know that chain can possibly help them, and they keep going after it. Um, so you'll find they're a lot of times torn up. 
Uh, one thing about a triple tail, uh, like the Cobia has that real powerful tail. Yeah, Cobia has a couple little spikes on his back, but those are, I mean, as long as you're not slamming your hand on it, you're probably not going to get affected by those. The triple tail has insanely sharp gill plates. The sharpest thing you've ever felt in your entire life, like a snook. Snook has razor blade sharp gill plates. Triple tail has the same thing. You go to grab a triple tail by the gills, and he's probably going to put your hand in two pieces. I mean, it is that sharp, and it's that quick that it'll do it. Uh, and even when you're filleting them, it seems like they want to hurt you with that thing. And you're, oh, geez, cut your finger all up. But um, the 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 like I said, the your buoy fish are going to be your most consistent bite. However, they're going to be your hardest fish to land. They're the most brutal. They're up and they have the advantage, especially when you're in a kayak. I mean, they have all the advantage in the world. <clears throat> Free swimming fish, it's a given. There's nothing for it to break off on. You put that bait in front of it, you hook it, and you just fight it and have loosen the drag a little bit, let them run, let them fight, let them do what they do. You're not going to get broke off. Okay. Same with those free swimming fish, which is which are pretty rare. Not 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 that I won't say that. You know, we see I I probably see upwards of 30 or 40 of them a year, and that's not talking big schools that you might come across. You know, individual fish just kind of floating out by themselves. Sometimes your biggest fish. Uh, the fish that come in on debris and weeds are the third kind of category of fish. In the debris and weeds fish, a lot of times people would think, oh, those fish floated in from way out there, which is the case. A lot of times they carry their fish from way out in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the Gulf Stream, and bring them in with it. But a lot of times, too, as those weeds float in, our fish that are already around come into those weeds and start hanging on them. Um, I've actually sat in large weed mats and you can watch fish leave and fish come in. They're different fish, and they just pop up here, pop up there as that weed match drifted along. Because the weed, lap, it's not attached to anything, it just floats. Um, those fish are probably, one, the most aggressive, easiest to catch. They're not very spooky. Sometimes the free swimmers can be a little spooky. If you get too close, they'll shoot down. Most of the time, they pop back up. That's a good thing. If you come across a triple tail and he shoots down, Spin around and wait for five minutes because they'll probably pop right back up, um, especially if they're free swimming. The debris and the weeds fish, a lot of times, if you come rolling up on a chunk of debris, they'll just get tighter and tighter up into it. They'll suck up underneath it. A five-gallon bucket, they'll go hide in the bucket. Okay? Um, these fish are specifically looking for sargasm fish and things of that nature, little, 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 little tidbits, little morsels. Um, so taking your... You know, your bigger jigs, yeah, they'll get hit. Um, and, of course, your live shrimp will always get hit. But uh, one thing I like to do is do the paddle tails on those. Do the three-inch paddle tail. Have that ready. Um, when I'm going out off the beach, if it's uh, king fishing, tarpon, cobia, whatever, I always have this rod right here with a three-inch paddle tail. And it's almost always the black and gold color which was what got me kicked off on it. Um, because it's versatile enough with a jig head that you can punch it down deep if you maybe see one. A lot of times you'll see them sitting 10, 15 down, feet down underneath a piece of structure. So the jig head allows you to punch down. Um, this you can rip fast across the top. You can let it sink and settle or do whatever you want. Um, the reason I go black and gold is because it yet again mimics that kind of tan, black, and, and yellowish of the seagrass, which all of those fish that they're used to eating from the time they're little itty-bitties all look like that. They're all blacks, tans, browns, things of that nature. So this black and black and gold seems really, I mean, when, they, when this comes rolling across the triple tail's face, typically they don't turn it down. Um, one thing I will do a lot of times, too, uh, especially if I'm dealing with fish that are in thick weeds, um, and when I'm talking thick weeds, we can have mats that are the size of this whole room right here. All right. And there could be triple tail all underneath there. If you actually dive, put on a scuba mask and dive up underneath that thing, there's probably a hundred of them underneath it. You might see one on the edge. Okay. What you can do with these, and especially too, if you don't have the real large mats, but more or less just kind of broken weeds, a lot of times those fish will be sitting right in that weed. And I'll take the same thing we're using for a redfish or a sea trout a weedless paddle tail lure and you can actually rip this right through the weeds i've had i've had 15 pound triple tail come up and slam this thing like it was a bass 
eating a frog off of lily pads. I mean, just demolish it straight through the weeds. Boom. You got to deal with all the weeds on your line afterwards, but you know, those are the things you deal with after you fish, hook the fish. But, um, you know, it's always good. I like when I'm out looking for weeds and stuff like that, I'm usually rolling with some, some jig heads and I'm always sure I have one of these or two of these. This is actually a little heavier one. I think this is a half. Um, so it can still sink a little bit, still has a little bit of punch. Uh, might be quarter. I don't know. It's heavy. It's got a lot of weight. I know I tried to throw it in the river and I was like, holy smokes. It sounded like a cannonball hitting the water. But, um, but this will punch down a little bit too. And it'll give you that kind of the jig headish. You know, the same thing though, you get a good hook set. Um, I think pretty much we've covered it. Uh, the, the big thing is, is just kind of be ready. You know, have these things ready and, and understand what you're looking at. Um, when you see a little tip come up in the distance when you're in your kayak, don't immediately think, oh, that's just a dolphin. S look at it. Pay attention to what's going on because that very well may, may be the, the, the fin tips of your ray that's only 100 yards away and you're on Cobia Central. Um, a lot of times that's what they'll do. They'll actually tip their fin tips up as they go, and it'll look like a dolphin came up or a shark. But if you watch it, you see two of them, and they're staying side by side, and they're not like zigzaggy or anything. It's a, it's a ray. You want to go over there, and you want to investigate. Not every ray is going to have fish, but a lot of times they do. Um, the triple tail, uh, like I said, if you're going to look to get the, the, the bite on the buoys and stuff like that, uh, the full moons are really your best times to go looking and really kind of hunting. Uh, anytime that wind blows from the east, good for a couple days, you have the potential of stuff to get blown in. Debris, flotsam, weeds, things of that nature. I know right now there's weeds out there. There's weeds floating around because we had that, that low pop off uh, and, and spin up outside. It pushed a bunch of stuff in and all that stuff will get displaced and pushed in from the Gulf Stream. It'll carry fish with it. Um, super fun fishery and uh, they're definitely uh, uh, the triple tail especially cobia have been one that have been popular for a long time triple tail weren't really known very well for the you know up until uh, you know about 15 20 years ago very few people thought about them or messed with them um, I've always loved to fish for them and uh, they're super good to eat too so there's there's nothing wrong with them that's for sure <laughs> they're good guys um, but you know basically this is all stuff that you can do and you don't have to have live bait. You don't have to go out there and cast net bait and manage it in your kayak in the middle of the ocean. You can go with a handful of lures and have really good shots of these fish. Uh, actually, I've got a couple of questions. If you don't mind. Yeah, fire them off. Uh, one is when you're talking about the, uh, the turkey tail mm -hmm. on the, uh, uh, the uh, anchor, mm -hmm. uh, the buoy, um, is it like any point all the way yeah. down to the bottom? Yeah. It could be anywhere, right? Yeah. All the way down to the bottom. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is we were hooking into a cloud of hornbill bellies mm -hmm. over and over again. You mentioned that uh, they actually like that because I've never caught anything on a hornbill. Right. No, they, typically your fish aren't going to eat them. But one thing hornbellies do is they congregate along edges like that. Like if you see, uh, like I was talking about, that was uh, things that you run into around the plankton. Okay, the plankton is going to uh, attract little tiny minnows which are going to attract those horn bellies. So they're a real good indicator if you see a lot of horn bellies in the area that there's probably a lot of little minnows. If there's probably a lot of little minnows, there's probably plankton also. So it's just yet another indicator of life and potential of what you're looking, ultimately looking for when you're looking for the manta rays, which is as much plankton as you can find because that's what they're looking for. Do you find that there's a, a time of the day that's better looking for cobia? Cobia typically... You're, um, typically your, your best time to look for them obviously is that sight fishing time of the day, the 10 to 2, just because you have the highest sun, you have the biggest view. Okay. Not necessarily because that's the only time the fish are up, but that's just the time where you can see the most, especially when you're already kind of cutting your, your, you know, your, your ability to see and substantially by sitting in a kayak, you know, having that super high bright sun will help you see those fish. However, a lot of times, like the fish that you'll find up in weeds and stuff like that, they'll be more active early. Like a normal, you know, fish on a weed line, like a dolphin, the first person there, there's three or four cobia working that weed line. Once those cobia get pushed off that weed line or maybe hooked or maybe a boat or two runs over it, well, those cobia are probably going to, you know, go on about their business. So, you know, some of those things are... Have you ever seen cobia in the surf? 
In the physical break, no, but I mean, I'm talking right on the color change, which is not even 50 yards outside of the, the actual break. Um, I mean, I, and you'll see them in that, that dark churned up water from where the physical break is, as it gets drugged out, drug out, they'll, they'll cruise back and forth in and out of that. I've seen a lot of them in there. I've never actually, you know, like almost like in the wave, yeah, like you know. Yeah, there's a really good chance. Yeah, really good chance. Yeah, and that. They were all small. They were, you know, 24 inches. Right, right, right. Yep. So they wouldn't make sense that it was a shark. No, typically you're going to have one, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's a really good chance they were cobia, and they were just cruising along. You know, it's it's they're fish. They have fins. There's no fences. There's no rules. They go wherever they please. You know, they're going to do whatever they want. Um, and truthfully, some of the most bait-rich water is that from the surf the first mile out. You know, you have a lot of your bait pods and stuff like that. Uh, that's one of the things I typically do, uh, um, you know, what we were doing uh you know, three or four weeks ago. And now, now I say that we had a slow season and that they've already been being caught up north. That doesn't mean you can't literally, one of you guys couldn't jump in your kayak tomorrow and go off of Patrick and run into a ray that has 45 cobia underneath it. Okay, it very easily can happen. It's the time of year to do it. The water's not super hot or anything like that. Um, but, you know, when... I kind of lost my train of thought. But with... <laughs> With those fish, you know, they don't really subscribe to any rules. So, you know, if you have the things that they like, well, there's a good chance they're going to be there, even if it isn't the exact right time of year or the exact right, you know, setup or scenario. Um, if you see a ray, there's probably going to be a Kobe on it. You know, I've even found, I, and, and it, you, you, you shoot for that 68 to 72, but uh, late fall, early winter, I've found rays out in the bite and had cobia on them and it's well below you know 68 degrees you know in the 65 range uh and there's still fish on them. those rays just happen to come in and you know you're not going to find a whole bunch of them you might find one or two but they'll still be there um anything else recommended preferred weight line weights and okay weights and stuff. yeah i had those sitting here i forgot to run through that okay the triple tail rod I'm going 15 pound, 12 to 15 pound braid, somewhere in there. Um, 40 pound uh, fluoro leader. That's that one right there. 40 pound will work for everything. Um, you can go a little lighter, but like I said, they have that gill plate. And if they shake that head or turn a little funny and they get that line in there, boom, it's gone. Even with 40, it's gone. So you don't want to go up to 60. That's a little bit obnoxious for the triple tail. They don't quite need to they'll go that heavy. Um, but uh, my my guy that does the commercial, he does he does 50 or 60 on all his triple tail rods, and he he fishes nothing but a cobia rod basically for his triple tail. Um, this one right here is a 4000 series, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's plenty to handle them, especially your open water fish. Uh, you might want something a little heavier, something in the 5000 range uh, for those those buoy fish, or your triple tail or your cobia rod. Just kind of throw your triple tail rig on it and send it down. Uh, for those buoy fish just to be safe if go as big as you can when you're on the buoy i mean as heavy as you got put it down because it's better to be safe than sorry if you go light on the buoy you're setting yourself up for hurt if you go heavy at least you've done everything you can to try and avoid the the breaking off of the fish um with the cobias i'll run 60 um and typically what i'm doing uh with the cobia leader with a, a triple tail leader, I'll just keep it your normal, you know, two foot, three foot. Um, a lot of times what I'll do with this cobia leader, and I didn't go quite as long as with this one as I wanted, um, which is, is another thing you want to, you know, make sure your knot's nice and slim. I'll try to have at least three to four foot of leader on this thing. Um, and that's mostly because when you're dealing with that fish close, if you do go to grab line and you're sitting there with a leader that's this long you're grabbing that braid and that's just a recipe for disaster with a big fish and potentially wet hands it'll probably take a finger off if it wanted to um, if it got wrapped around it right <coughs> this braid is like a razor blade when it's taunt and it comes across wet skin it cuts and it cuts deep um so, so what, weight, weight is what? Uh, the on that one. this is 20. 20. yeah 20 pound braid 60 pound leader 
four. I'm looking for you know anywhere from four to four to five foot a liter. You know, three is okay. That way you can grab a hold of that and try to maybe maintain control of your fish, and you have some something to grab a hold of with that heavier leader um, and a little bit longer one. You want to keep your your hand kind of up. Um, but yeah, I do the 20 and the 60. You can go to 30. I like 20 because it flies off that reel nice and light. I mean, it, it goes. You can't break 20 pound braid. I mean, you can pull a dang truck with this stuff. I mean, it's so strong. You know, it's it. You know, and for for especially when you're in a kayak, <clears throat> you're not going to be putting the pressure on that fish that you would like in a boat because you're literally being pulled with it. No matter how hard you're pulling back against that fish, it's still pulling you that way. So you're not putting that pressure um, that you would. So you can get away with a little bit lighter line. But this is the same line I use on. This is my cobia rod from my boat or my kayak. Doesn't matter. Um, and it's all 20 pound. Uh, and um, that that reel right there, I think that's the old 750 or something. I've had that reel since I was probably 15 years old, and that thing does work. But um, you know, something in the 6,000 range, something that can hold that line, because you hook a big cobia and it's gonna dump 150 yards of line like that. He's gonna go. And he's going to go straight the opposite way of the way you want him to go, and he's going to keep going. A super powerful fish. One thing I do try to keep on my boat anytime I'm out there looking for big fish, whether it's tarpon, whether it's cobia or whatever on my kayak, is a drift sock. It's a real small, it's cheap, it's easy to stow, and if you have that ready to clip off to a handle or anything on your boat, when you do hook a big fish, boom, clip it off, throw the drift sock out, and you've just tripled the drag if not more that you can and the, the leverage you can put on that fish because that that fish you know like i said even even though you're pulling back even you're pulling back you're sliding yourself further forward you know that drift sock will help give you some bite i've had cobe or a tarpon pool me and a client i'm holding on to the back of the, the the client's kayak the handle side saddle in my kayak with a drift sock behind me and still been drugged three and a half miles offshore you know it's they'll drag you Drift sock will kind of help help put leverage on that bigger fish and uh, and get it done. Do you need to put that drift sock like like I mean the worst thing you want to do is get pulled sideways into a into a into swells. You know, right, so right. You want to put that on an anchor line. Um, you can do your trolley and get it back behind. Um, what I've found is is due to the fish you know pulling is even if you go off the side of your boat and typically you have a little bit of lead on it too that the fish is still going to pull you yeah. even with the sock. It's not going to end up snapping you sideways, drift sock, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So even though it's going to still kind of maintain, even though it's on side ship or mid ship, it's still going to kind of maintain and it'll help give you that drag. But yeah, if you can get it directly behind you, obviously, one thing you don't want to do is clip it, you know, have it maybe pre-clipped on the back thing. Because then when you deploy it and it's out there, that's great. But then what do you do when... The fish is close. That thing's way behind you. You want to have everything to where you can manage it. You know, if it is a big fish and you are going to take it with you, you're going to probably want to get that drift sock out of the way when you go to land that fish. Up, stuff it in the boat. That way you don't have that obstruction. Yet another thing it could potentially break you off on. Okay? Yeah, that kind of brings me to the point that um, with kayak, since we have so limited mm -hmm. amount of space, uh, I've gone out there with some sabiki for the bait fish uh -huh. and you go for the cobia. But if you got a sabiki out there and you can hook a cobia, it's almost better like taking a tactic and going, I'm going to go find some triple tail and yeah. along the way if I see some manta rays yep. and forget about the live bait. Yeah. That's typically what I do is when I'm out there and I, the, the most of the cobia that I've run into, Justin Ritchie, that big old giant one that he got last year, uh, I think I think it was like, I don't know, it was a slob. But he was, co he was triple tar uh, tarpon fishing. You know, and he happened to hook a big cobia. And that was late in the season. You know, that was a big fish. Um, but typically, the cobia that I've run across, I've been out doing something else. Just happened to be ready for that fish when he did happen up on me. So it is, um, you know, and yet again, that, that, that cobia and both the cobia and the triple tail. You know, triple tail are easy. Even if you do live shrimp, you can throw them in a little bag. They don't have to be kicking perfectly live. Um, you know, or you can put them in a bag with some ice. Uh, you know, double bag it, put them in a bag by themselves with a little bit of water in a bag of ice, and those things will stay alive for as long as that ice is there. Uh, it kind of puts them in suspended animation. But, um, you know, to sit there and actually collect bait and then go go looking for a, tr a cobia is going to be a lot of work that you probably don't necessarily need to do. 
you know, because you can uh, you can accomplish your goal of hooking that cobia typically with an artificial, no problem. You see these guys when they go cobia fishing, very few of them will even stop to even think about a bait. They have their jigs and they go because they so readily take these things, um, these big fluffy jigs and stuff like that. Pretty much, I found that if a cobia is going to eat, if it goes in front of it, it's going to eat it. If they're not going to eat, you will throw everything you have at them, and you're not going to get them to eat. Um, but if it wants to eat, it's going to jump on it, whether it's this big old bright jig or if you happen to only have this rod and a cobia pops up and you have this little jig on there and you put it in front, he's going to eat it. You, know? um, you don't have to have that frisky live bait. Uh, they will light up on it, of course, but you don't have to have it. Pinfish work great too. Something that you maybe can use in a bubbler, you know, as opposed to a pogey, where you got to try to maintain that bait and keep it alive, or a thread fin where you got to try to keep it alive. Something like a pinfish you can put on a bubbler bucket. That way you have a couple of them. You can buy them at the store or get them the day before or whatever. Uh, cast in a couple, and uh, those are a hardy bait. They'll last all day on a bubbler, no problem. Um, most of them, if you do two or three, you could just sit there and change the water out every 30 or 40 minutes and not even have a bubbler on them. Um, that way you do have a live bait to deploy if you wanted to, but they're so readily taken on those artificials, it's not, almost not even worth it. So. Anything else? Thank you, Alex. Very much. All right. Thank you. Can, you. can you say something about the Fort Canaveral Rail? Okay. Well, yeah. Well, I'll take and, and it the rest of the night. night. And, and I know yeah, this right. is going to take the rest of the night, right. so I just want to mention that uh, next month's meeting is on also the first Thursday. We have, uh, he mentioned Justin Ritchie coming out, and we're going to be talking about tarpon. And um, it'll be good. So, we'll out. And in the meantime, um, okay, real quick, I'll give you the quick synopsis of the quick report of the Port Canaveral Rail. For those that don't know, Port Canaveral has decided that they want to become one of the leaders of cargo in the southeastern United States. To do this, they're going to have to put a railway in. Their original plan that they went to get an environmental impact statement, it's not a study, it's a statement, because they really don't study much of anything, um, was a plan to actually put a causeway across the no-motor zone. Um, if you don't know where that is, it's you know over on the east coast, It's most everybody knows where the no-motor zone is. Um, as of right now, they have no clue what they're doing, uh, which is probably the closest report that I have to you. Uh, they backpedaled everything that they were pushing through. Um, it's kind of all up in the air. Our big thing and what I've been doing is I started a little group, No Fill, No Kill. Uh, it's on Facebook. I'm sure if you have me any way associated to your Facebook, you've probably seen something come across um, because I'm pumping it out nonstop. We've done a couple of rallies at their meetings, um, and we're going to continue to do it. Uh, our big thing is... One, we don't feel that there needs to be another causeway come across the lagoon. We have enough of them. There's other land, other, way to, there's other ways that they can do this. If they do have to put a causeway across the lagoon, there should be no berm. Um, right now, as the plan stands, there'll be about 6,000 feet of fill dirt put in. Uh, a bridge, um, like every other causeway that we have. Um, for those that don't understand the hydrology of the way our lagoons work, they're non-tidal, slow-moving water. It's all done by wind, uh, north and south wind, moving current up and down. So what ends up happening is each one of these causeways that we've put in chokes that flow at every step of the way. So it's crawl, it's, it's, it's kind of put it down to a crawl. It's one of the reasons why our lagoons are in such bad health, uh, why the grass die-offs are happening. There's no way for the bad stuff to get out and fresh water to get in. Um, People talk about inlets, and there's a lot of different things that need to be done, but one thing that definitely doesn't need to be done <laughs> is another earthen causeway across it. So we're doing everything we can, and, um, uh, you know, we're, like I said, we're doing rallies and stuff like that. If you write a congressman, right? I don't, you know, write anybody and just say, hey, we enjoy this waterway. At least think about it before you do this. Uh, that's our big thing. We understand that rail's got to happen probably at the port, um, but we don't have to sacrifice what we have for it. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a tough situation. And, and, uh, like I said, I could honestly go on all night and I don't want to about it, but a uh, big thing is we just don't need any fill dirt in that lagoon. It's the last thing the lagoon needs by any means. Um, so yeah, if you want to get active on it, look me up on, uh, either on Facebook or hit me up. Um, I don't have any cards with me. I meant to grab a whole stack of them and I didn't, but my, uh, actually I don't think it made it to this one. I'm going to be doing the Orlando, I believe, from now on. Um, I don't think it printed this one, 
Uh, but you will be able to find my car, kayak fishing article in the Orlando um, cam from now on, uh, I believe starting this coming next month. Um, it might even be in that one. It'll be um, coming out uh, for you guys over here. I'll keep you posted on that. Look me up on Facebook or give me a call or anything like that, and uh, we can uh, get you straightened out if you want to come help out or something. And uh, I'm going to be out there with my mouth going. So <laughs> you guys at least got that going for you, so I'll be fighting for them to the end. So. If you guys want to look me up real quick, localliancecharters.com. Feel free, anytime, give me a call. You're still Triple the, tail. Uh, the, uh, uh, and I can't speak English today. Uh, uh, carrying the kayaks out? Yeah. Offshore. Yeah, I am. Um, and what I do, yeah, mothership. Um, what I did was last year, uh, I've always offered it. It's something that I've offered since the very beginning of my business. It just never really... You know, I mean, it's so easy to launch off the beach to go catch a tarpon. Um, what I did this last year, though, is we actually went out and did. Uh, <laughs> we went <laughs> a little ribbing on a. Yeah, so easy. Um, <laughs> we actually took for uh, the red snapper season. We went out and did uh, mothership trips. Red snapper fished, got our limits, came back in. It was really fun, and I will be doing it again this year. Um, it looks like I have no clue when they're going to actually tell us when we get the red snapper season. But as soon as it comes up, I'm going to be pumping those trips out. So it'll be, uh, it's a fun trip. And um, it actually looks like I run a skiff right now, a little flats boat, and I'm actually upgrading hopefully in the next couple months to a bigger a bay boat. Um, so that might give me some more capabilities too in that. So definitely if it's something that you might want to do, maybe go out in the middle of the ocean and float around a kayak, look me up because we definitely can do it. And uh, it's insanely fun. <laughs> what was the name of that trail again? Uh, what was that? What was, what was the name of your um, mothership group? Or what oh, was it called? The Charter. The Charters, LocalLinesCharters.com. Yeah, local lines. Charters. Yeah, local lines. Um, and, uh, yeah, just look me up. And if you have any questions about the rail or anything like that, give me a call. If you want to help out, write a letter, like I said. Uh, come to a rally, put on a shirt, and yell at some commissioners. You can do that, too. It's kind of fun. Well, yeah, I'm good at that. Uh, John Walsh does not like to see me coming. He's... <laughs> Put, put, put the contacts out there on your thing so people yeah. have the right letters. Yeah, I will. And, uh, you've got, uh, there's a posting on the Port Authority as of today, I think, where um, you can post your opinion. Yeah. Comments. Yeah. So, yeah. They want, they want to see how well the people receive their meeting. And I was like, that's not really a good idea. You realize I have the Internet, don't you? <laughs> but, um, no, it's, uh, it's really kind of ridiculous. It's, it's unnecessary. Uh, there's other ways that they can do it. Um, frankly, those guys aren't going to have to live with it. It's our kids that are going to have to live with it. My kids and, and your grandkids and your kids are going to have to have that causeway across the lagoon. Those guys don't give two craps. They're going to have a golden parachute at some place once they're done being commissioners. They care less. So unless we cause a stink and freak them out, nothing gets done. It gets done exactly how they want. The next thing we're doing is actually the 20th of May. Um, this last meeting that we went to, I was accused of commandeering it, I guess, or something like that, uh, something to that effect, um, was an informational meeting that they didn't want to let us speak at all at. We kind of forced the issue. Uh, this next one we're doing the 20th, uh, it's early, it's, it's 8.39 in the morning in the port, uh, is actually a commissioner meeting, and they have to let us speak. So they don't have a choice. They've got to sit there and take what I got for three minutes, and they aren't going to be happy when they hear what I have to say. But on that note, you need more people to talk for three minutes, right? Yeah, well, what we're going to do is, right now, my little event that we got on the online, I think we're sitting right around 75 to 80 people. Um, even if I can get half that, and if I can get half of those, if I can get 20 people to stand there for three minutes, that is a, that's an hour of, yeah, right? Yeah, that's an hour-ish of people sitting there droning on about how no, you know, Phil in the lagoon is wrong. And... Believe me, they'll get cranky after a while and they don't get to eat their coffee and donuts and get up and leave 15 minutes after the meeting starts like usual. They're used to those meetings having five people in them. Maybe one person will stand up and it's the same old lady that stands up every time. So. But isn't putting the fill across the lagoon going to be a fifth as expensive as putting pilings all the way across? Yeah. That's the, that's the rub. Yeah. That's the rub. It is, it's it's cheap. And that's why we did it with all the other causeways, because it's cheap. It's not right, but it's cheap. You know, so. Lower maintenance, too. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot lower maintenance. Yeah. You know. Focus on the uh, culprits. Yeah. That's, that's the only yeah, and that's what we're. Only gonna, 
that's the only way it's going to work. Yeah, and that's what, you know, we've gotten to a point. Um, I know the port likes to act like right now that, that oh, this, uh, you know, this just happened. I'll get these from you. Um, you know, we're just starting this. It's been going on for years now. That they've, been, they've actually been pushing for rail for 30-plus years. But this, this last push has started about, about a year, year and a half ago. Um, to get this rail going and um, you know when I started my little fight it was actually just the no fill no kill came solely from me standing on that podium yelling at them saying if you don't put this fill in you're not going to kill my river and then it went from that to no fill no kill exploding so basically where we started out was we just don't want the fill you know we've got enough of a, a voice almost I'd hate to say which is scary <laughs> to think about but we do um, they know who we are when we walk into those meetings and uh, you know now is the time where we're gonna try to work with them maybe and you know if it's gonna come in if it's gonna be Phil we get the culverts you know we came in boom 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 no 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 which is the way you come into any any meeting or anything else you come from the strongest point you can and then you back off of that as you work through you know you know not that I expect the Port Canaveral you know commissioners to negotiate with me but I'm certainly making their life hell right now and I'm sure they'd like for it to stop at any point in time. So, um, you know, we'll see where we get with it. I'm going to keep fighting it, and uh, we're going to see if we can't get it. There's a lot of people out there. Uh, there's a lot of concerns, even from interested parties that have to be involved in the process, FWC, Refuge. A lot of people are concerned about this, and uh, hopefully we can do something with it. So I'll stop now because I won't stop if I don't. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you.